ignore that. No, it's right here. It'll be fine. Janet, anybody else? Honestly, I don't know. It's bad to say sometimes, but if I didn't have the van to drive, I probably wouldn't have been here this morning. And. Uh, You know, there's some things you you don't mind saying and some things you ashamed to say. But that's just the truth. Because this morning I was in a lot of pain and uh but I can honestly say that I'm thankful to be able to be here. And unless something changes I could walk out of here just like everybody else. My toe's a little bit uncomfortable, but it ain't nothing like it was this morning. I couldn't hardly walk. I called Ken. I told Ken, I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but I said, you better be ready because I said, as of right now, I don't think I could stand behind the podium. I don't think I could do it this morning. I couldn't stand in the pulpit because it was just hard just getting out of bed this morning, just to be honest. But it didn't feel no better in the bed, so it didn't really make much difference where he was at. But, but uh, as God had gave me something to, to give, I don't know where it's going to go this morning, but um, we're going to be in First Peter chapter 5 is what I hope we're going to go to. But as I was sitting in Sunday school and as we were talking about all different things this morning, we had a good Sunday school class, and, and we always have good Sunday school class. Anybody that misses Sunday school, you're missing a blessing because you get to share things in Sunday school that you don't get to share whenever you're out here. When we're out here and we're having church service and we're having preaching service, it's usually a one-sided argument if you want to look at it that way. I'm delivering a message, Ken's delivering a message, but when you're in Sunday school, you get a chance to interact and be able to say, not saying you came out here, but it's not nearly as easy to do so because of the way the service is set up. So Sunday school, we had real good discussion this morning, and um, I'll try to make this make it through it. But while you're trying to find your place there in First Peter chapter five, is which is where the sermon's going to come from today. God gave me something as I was just as I was leaving Sunday school and as I was walking out here, because as I left Sunday school, it hurt. But I'd already kind of made up my mind I'm going to preach anyway because. That's just what I'm supposed to do. Because what God showed me was, he says, well, tomorrow morning at 6.30 when you wake up, if your toe feels the same way tomorrow morning at 6.30, are you going to stay at the house or are you going to hobble down to the truck and you're going to go to the job site and you're going to work? Is that what you're going to do? Well, the answer was, I'm going to do whatever i got to do tomorrow to do the job that I've told people that I'm going to do to the best of my ability. But see, it's real easy for me to make a phone call and say, Ken, is there any way that you can just go ahead and take care of what I'm supposed to do this morning because I'm not 100%. See, I've preached from the pulpit before and I've said, you know what? If you've got cancer, if you've got a problem, if something's happened to you, Pray that God take it away, but if he don't, we're still supposed to move on. When we're supposed to quit on God is whenever we're no longer here, meaning that it doesn't make any difference. Because if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, y'all don't have to turn there because I'm just going to read it. This is not probably where the sermon's going to come from. But as God showed me this, this is what he said. 
Now, I'm not comparing myself to Paul because I'm not even close to a Peter whenever he was having all his bad times. So I'm not trying to put myself and say that I'm Paul, but whenever we think about other people and we use examples in the Bible, where are we supposed to be at and how should we be and what should we do? Because there's so many times whenever it don't have to be gout. It don't have to be I found out I've got cancer. It don't have to be I just lost a loved one. It don't have to be any of those things. All it takes is something small most of the time that dictates whether we do something for Christ or not. But this is what he told Paul in chapter 2, or excuse me, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to start in verse 5 because I don't want to get through, I don't want to get to the, the message. But it says, Of such of one will I glory yet of myself, I will not glory but in mine infirmities. You know what? In all the problems he's got, he's going to glorify God. For thought I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which me seeth me to be, and that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me or to beat me or to tear me down, lest I should be exalted above measure. So I'm just going to bring us up to speed here. Paul don't want the edification of people. And sometimes for us to not have the edification of people, God's got to put us in our place sometimes and says, you know what? You can't do nothing without me. See, if he always takes everything away from you, if you have a problem, if you have this, if you have that, and God always just removes it, the same as parents with children. If we always fix all the problems all the time to where they never go in through anything, when finally something does happen, the whole world shuts down. See, and today, it would be easy for me to say, well, you know what? God didn't take something away from me, so I'm just going to, you know what? Just forget about it. God understands because, you know what? When God gave me a message to preach, he knew I wasn't going to preach it anyway. I don't even know why he gave it to me. Because he knew, see, because God knows all, he knew that, he really was going to have Ken prepared anyway. He knew that all those pieces of the puzzle was going to just fall together. You know why? Because God knew that Alvin was going to have a sore toe and he wasn't going to be able to do what I asked him to do anyway. I don't even know why I gave him one. I mean, that's my thinking process. It's because we have to rely on him. When I was sitting right here, my toes hurt. And God gave me this scripture and showed me. You do what I asked you to do. And when you make that decision to do what I asked you to do. Then he might fix it. He may not. It's still sore but it don't hurt. There's a difference. This is what it says in verse 8. It says for this thing I besought the Lord thrice. That it might depart from me. I'll put it in my words. I pray that God just take it away so I can do things the way that I want to do them, not the way that God wants to do them, because that's basically how it works out. The reason why we don't want the problems in our lives, why we don't want to have this or that to happen or to be obstacles in our life, because it makes life easier for us. If we were willing to do God's work anytime whenever it's just easy, kind of like life is, we always want to take the path of least resistance. We just, if, you know what? Don't never say that sin sin because it's a whole lot easier just to say, well, you know what, if, if it's right for you, then it's okay. It's not right for me, but it's, it's okay if you do it because that's just the way you feel. No, it's either right or it's wrong. That's right. That's right. You know, it's a whole lot easier just to tell your kids whenever they're crying and screaming and they're wanting to do what they want to do is to say, okay, just go on and do what you do, just leave me alone. 
But see, then at some point in life, you realize that that might have been easier then, but it's getting awful stinking hard today because I'm having to deal with this. See, which is easier for Alvin to make a decision because his toe hurts or whenever I'm faced with a situation within my family that I've got to decide whether I'm going to quit my job because of my beliefs. See, if I can't make it through the small things, how in the world am I going to make it through the big things? But this is what God gave Paul when he asked for him to take away the thorn in his flesh. And if it's good enough for Paul, it ought to be good enough for Alvin. But this is what he said in verse... I'm going to put a little bit of my words to it just so you can get the full gist of it. But God said unto me, it says in the scriptures, he said, but it means God. It says, God said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Amen. Yes. See, when you're not where you can do it, or whenever it's not the way that you would have for it to be, that's when God actually shows his evidence that he's the one that's doing it. Right. See, if everything was always just simple in life, if it was always just easy, then why do we need God? See, we've tried to create this thing in life called our own God. To where we've, we've even done it to our children. We've made it to where everything's easy. We don't. We were sitting there the other night, and we've. And you know, I'm thankful because I'd probably have to be the one to go out on the porch and unplug it. But you know, we've we've got these little things now where you can just plug in something, and all you do is say, "Turn my light off," and the Christmas lights go off outside. You know, that's pretty nice. But we've carried that over even into how we deal with our children today. We carried that over into how we deal with our church family today. See, if, if all we do is just say it and everybody just, it's just like, you know what, it may be okay for Tim to do something, but I just don't think that God meant for me to do it. But who am I to say that if Tim was running around on his wife, that it's, okay, it's, it's wrong? Who am I to say that it's wrong for you to be a homosexual and to practice homosexual? Who am I to say that it's wrong for you to kill a baby inside the mother's womb because I wouldn't do it doesn't mean that it's not okay for you to do it. And that's the position that the church has took today. You know, I'm not going to do it myself, but who am I to say that somebody else shouldn't do that? It's because we take the path of least resistance. The least resistance this morning would have been for me to sit on the pew and let Ken do it. Ken would have preached a good message this morning. But I found out a long time ago, most of the time when I preach a message, it's not for you guys, it's more for me. I do a whole lot more growing than the people that I end up preaching to. But he said, and God said unto me, my grace is sufficient for, your, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly. Now, see, it's not just sometimes where we just say, well, okay, I just got to, I got to, you know, I got to stick in there and just make it happen. Why? Because God told me to do it. But what did he say? But most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may be, may rest upon me. Yes. He wasn't just now at the point to where he's still going to do it, but he's resenting it the whole time. You know what? I might still preach this morning, but you know what? I'm going to complain about it the whole time. And when I get home, I'm going to complain about it. You know what I'm saying? In your mind, you're going through all these things. Well, that's what Paul said. No. He said, God says my grace is sufficient. And I'm even glad that God didn't take it away from me. 
That's what he said. I'm glad, therefore, that I would rather glory in my infirmities and the problems that I've got that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Because, see, what would have happened with Paul? If God had chose to remove that from Paul, Paul knew enough about himself to where Paul would have said, well, I'm doing it myself. And I don't have to have God. But whenever he realized that he couldn't do nothing without God, and God said, you know what, I know that you can't do it without me, but I'm going to leave this little old problem you got, whatever it may be, just so you have to rely on me. So be thankful sometimes about the problems, the infirmities, and those things that you have, because God may have left them there for a reason. Because if he'd have took them away, you wouldn't be who you are today. And it carries right over into what we were going to talk about this morning. See, all different kind of things happen for different reasons. I believe that every person you made to believe different than me, that's fine. That's between you and God. It has nothing to do with me. But I believe every one of us is here for a reason this morning. I don't think anybody's here just by happenstance. I don't think it was just by accident. I do believe there's a reason that we're here and there's a reason that all the circumstances that took place is what's took place this morning. It's for us to bring us to a place to where we are at this morning, to bring us to a level as to where we need to be. And I don't know what that is, but God does. Yes. But I do believe that there's a purpose for everything. Because there's this big problem we have that there's nobody that is immune to it. Not everybody's going to get a problem with their toe. Not everybody's going to get cancer. Not everybody's going to have a heart attack. Not everybody's going to have a loved one to die this week. Not everybody's, not everybody's going to have all these things. But there is something that all of us are going to have and God is just as sufficient for it as he is all those other things. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, and for time's sake, I'm going to just read one verse. If you look at the little bit he's telling them what they should do, and we've kind of went over that in Sunday school the last few weeks, is what each one of us's role is here in the church. I don't care if you're a deacon or if you're a lay person or somebody that just comes once in a while. If you're a Christian, God has a purpose for you being here. And he has a responsibility that he's given you. If you're one of the older Christian men, he gave you a job. The older Christian women, he gave you a job. Now, whether you choose to do it or not, that's up to you, and you will answer for that. You can take that however you want to. And these younger men... They have a job, and there's a duty that they have because you know why? If the Lord tarries, those younger men are going to be the older men one day and going to do the same thing. The same way with the, older, the younger women. Why does the older women need to teach the younger women? Is because the younger women are going to be the older women one day. Just in the time that I've been here at this church, I can see where there's a lot of older women are gone. And the younger women have become the older women, and now... They're the ones that's responsible for these younger people that are coming up. We have a responsibility as a Christian that we're going to have to do. But that's what he's telling them here in these first few verses. And we get over to 8, and he tells them something and finishes it off. And the reason is because he tells them all these things that I'm not going to go over. You can read it in 1 Peter chapter 5. But he gives us the reason that he tells us those things. And then if you know, well, let's just read it. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So why do you need to teach the kids? Why do you need as older Christians need to be teaching the younger Christians. Why? It's because there's an adversary out there called the devil that is seeking to destroy you. Seeking to destroy you. 
In verse 9 it says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that this, excuse me, yeah, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Satan is out to destroy all of us. There's nobody in here that will not have to deal, I won't say specifically with Satan, but with the snares that Satan has. And that's what I want to talk to us just a few moments this morning about. Is if I was going to put it as the snares of Satan. Because I've said before, you know, Satan, if he was all dressed in red, big old black horns, and carrying a big old pitchfork, and when he talked, big old fire come out of him, they wouldn't nobody have a problem resisting him because you would walk on the other side of the road. You wouldn't go down that alley. You wouldn't go down those areas. But see, that's not how it works. I remember when I was a little boy, I was probably about nine years old whenever I first learned about these things. I'd probably heard about other people. And, um, but I actually got to do it, and it was so fun. But the reason why I guess it was so fun is because you were trying to catch something with a means of trickery. That's what you did. They're called rabbit gums. Now, in that rabbit gum, we didn't put a dog on the back side of it that whenever that rabbit looked in, a dog barked at it. Because why? You ain't going to catch too many rabbits if the dog's barking, are you? We, we didn't put a piece of a steak inside the back of the rabbit gum because rabbits could care less about red meat. They don't need it. See, we didn't pick things that we put in the back of the rabbit gum that would not attract rabbits. But I remember... I went out one time and I checked all of our rabbit gums and I, I learned at a very young age, again, because of bad experiences, is that, I don't know if y'all know, but when a rabbit gum, and I don't even know if people make them anymore or what, but we used to love to set them. We had about 11 of them, I think. I was counting up and we had about 11 that we would set. But they're real narrow and you have to make them narrow so whenever they hit the trip mechanism, they can't get out on one side or the other because if you made it real wide, they might trip it, but they might still be able to move around, get out. They might be able to go around it and not trip it and get what you got. And, but they go in head first. And we didn't always catch rabbits. Sometimes we'd catch possums, which is very scary when you open a rabbit gum and see its teeth sometimes. And you could catch a skunk in there once in a while but if you caught a skunk in it, remember, they go in head first and you open it up on the back door. I don't know if you know how skunks spray, but you don't, I never got sprayed by one, but I did see somebody get sprayed one time. But I remember if you ever had a skunk to get in one and it actually sprayed while it was in that box, you pretty much had to throw the box away. But we would try to keep the box because we wanted to not have to build another one. We would take an old apple and cut it in half and we'd rub that box all over. We'd rub that box down and try to get it where it would have the scent that they would want to have and cover up because nobody likes being around a skunk except another skunk. But how we would trick those rabbits is we'd put something in the back. We'd put an apple or we'd put some kind of greens or whatever. I don't even remember what all we put in there. But we'd put it in the back and then we'd go out that evening or the next day and we'd check those rabbit gums and it was so exciting whenever you would see that gum had been, the trip had been set and the door was shut on it. You knew you had something. You weren't exactly sure what you might have, but most of the time we'd have a rabbit. But I got to thinking about the snares of life and how that rabbit gum works. See, we didn't catch rabbits by putting stuff in there that rabbits didn't like. We caught rabbits by putting stuff in there rabbits liked. And the reason why the rabbit got caught was because, just like we are, we get tunnel vision. When we see something we like, just like Peter when he was walking on water, what he should have had was tunnel vision on Christ, but he got to looking at everything else. See, we forget about all the problems or potential hazards when we see what we want. 
See, that rabbit goes in there, and there's only one thing that rabbit's thinking about is that food that's on the back side of that little trigger mechanism. See, it's not having a thought process of, what is this box here? This is out of the ordinary. It's in the woods. Trees have bark on the outside. This don't have bark on it. Usually there's bugs inside of a tree log. There's not bugs. You see what I'm saying? If we go through it as a logical thing, the same thing as we should be doing as Christians, whenever we see things that we like, but we know it's out of the ordinary and it's not normal, but we go ahead and go after it anyway. But the bad part is when you actually get to it, and you get what you thought you wanted. The door's already shut. See, when it gets to a point where you realize that I'm not where I should be, and I'm in a bad situation, but I got here because of something that I thought I wanted, I can't remember how many rabbit gums I would go, and they didn't even eat the food. What drawed them in there they didn't even eat after they got trapped in there? Because then what happened is what brought them in they didn't eat no more. Because now their whole thought or their desire is to get out of the mess that they're in. And I'm afraid so many Christians today, that's what we do. We have went in after something and then we don't even really care, but we don't know how to get out. We're fighting a battle. There's only one person that can open the rabbit gum and that's the master that set the rabbit gum. See, now I had a choice. Whenever I went back around, I could open the door, and I've done that the first couple of times, is you open the door, and if you ain't real careful, that rabbit will shoot out, and you lost your rabbit. But see, this is what I think happens. In this thing called life that God created, that we mess up so much and don't trust him, see, he's the only one that can free us from the gun and it'll not be bad. There'll be a time whenever we get out of the rabbit gum. But if it's Satan that's letting us out of the rabbit gum, you're going from one bad instance to the next. And the next one's going to be worse. I don't know if y'all know or not. Some of the kids might not. But, you know, we didn't catch the rabbits to play with them in the yard. We caught the rabbits because we was planning on going to be eating it not shortly thereafter. That's what the scripture says. Satan sets snares for you because he's planning on devouring you and destroying you. So I'm going to hit these pretty quick. I've got five points or four points and I want to hit them just really quick. The first one is don't stray. If the rabbit had stayed where the rabbit's supposed to be and not went around what it's supposed to be in that, it wouldn't be in the rabbit gun. You know what, if we stay where we're supposed to be, where God tells us to be, if we're a Christian, God's going to tell us where we're supposed to be at. And if we're in the wrong place, he's going to tell us. And if we listen, we're going to avoid a lot of these snares. We're not going to get in the gun. But first is we don't need to stray. It says in Psalms chapter 119, verse 67, it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now... Have I kept thy word? Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Meaning, a problem came on you because you decided to not listen to God. And then, he made a choice here. Now, I keep the word. Sometimes, we've got to have some discipline in our lives. Meaning, that Christ disciplines us or God disciplines us to get us back on the path. Now, I don't like discipline too much. I, I don't even like giving it. But I definitely don't like receiving it. But if I do what I'm supposed to do, I won't have no discipline, will I? So the first thing is, don't go astray to begin with. Don't go astray. I'll just tell you how you go astray. I'll just give you a little short scenario and... It's pretty quick. Now, I'm not saying everybody fits this, but 99% of the time, this is how it works. The first is, 
Christians sometimes neglect their prayer life. Neglect their prayer life. And then they fail to study. People quitting coming to church ain't the first thing that happens. I've said that often. When you see a Christian, when they quit coming to church, they were gone a long time before they ever quit coming. It's the things that they were doing or not doing at home that happened a long time before we ever seen the evidence, meaning that they weren't here. But see, part of our duty is, is to recognize that maybe they're acting just a little bit different. Maybe we should have asked some questions. Maybe we should have done something to help them from going astray while we still had the opportunity. Because once they leave the church, it's hard to get people back in. That happens. But it's hard. It's a whole lot easier to retain than it is to recruit. So the first thing is don't go astray. In James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee you. Resist the devil, and he will flee you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. If we resist the devil, he's going to flee from us. If we submit to the devil, he's going to jump right in the boat with us and we're going to go at it. So don't stray away. The next is, I'll read this in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. It says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Don't strut around. Don't be proud. Don't be better than everybody else. And I'm not talking about just acting like you're better than everybody else. But you know what? We might get to a point sometimes, and I see this happen with Christians, is that nobody else is as smart as I am. When you get to a point where you think you know it all, you know the least. Why? Because you know what? We can do nothing without Christ. Now, there's some people that are more biblically smart than others. And some people that are even more spiritual than others. But if you have Christ that lives inside you called the Holy Spirit, we're all on an equal playing ground. It's just whether we allow it to happen or not. But what does it say? Pride goeth before destruction. Meaning, just to put it in my words, when you become too prideful, you're getting ready to just hold on. You're getting ready to fall. Things are getting ready to go south for you. And I wonder if that's not why God left that infirmity for Paul was because he knew Paul would fall into that prideful thing. Because what did he say? He said, I'm glad that God left this infirmity with me because I have to rely on his strength. See, people get to a point where they say, you know what? I know more than everybody else or I even know more sometimes than what God does. And you know what? I don't need him. Because what's happened, they, they don't come to church no more. Because why do I need to be around all those people that's not as smart as I am? I don't need to sit in a Sunday school class that they don't teach as much as what I know. You see what I'm saying? It's very easy for us to fall into that category if you ain't careful. But usually destruction comes shortly after there and you'll see that happen in people's lives. Because James chapter 4 verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. If you'll humble yourself, Christ will lift you up. But see, whenever we exalt ourselves, you're going to get a reward. But it says your reward be here on earth. It won't be here after. So don't stray, but also don't strut or don't be proudful. And in Romans chapter 12 and verse 21, it says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Don't stoop as low as the next man. See, it's a whole lot easier. We take the golden rule sometimes and say, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Well, I'll do unto him as he's done to me. That's really how the golden rule is. Is I'll do to you as you've done to me. See, if, if you didn't talk nice to me, I'm not going to talk nice to you. If you mistreat me, I'm going to mistreat you, and I actually want to make sure that you feel just as bad as I feel. See, ain't that what the golden rule says, is that do unto others as they do to you. No. It says, do unto others as you would have them to do to you. Meaning, you treat them the way you would like for them to treat you, not treat them the way they're treating you, because they may treat you like dirt, but you're supposed to treat them godly because that's what God says for us to do. So don't stoop as low as the next man. That's why we're in the mess we're in today, is because this person mistreated me, and I'm going to mistreat them, and I don't care. So now I've had a bad day and I'm going to mistreat this person as bad as what I feel and that person is going to feel the same thing so they're going to mistreat me. Next thing you know, all of us is mistreating each other. And it'd be nice to say that the only place that happens is outside the four walls of the church, but it happens inside the church as much as it happens outside the church. I remember a preacher one time, I was listening to him preach, he said, the meanest people I've ever met are Christians. He said they talk about you and they're the meanest people they are. And I thought about that. How in the world would he get to a point where he's like that? It's probably because he pastored a church. Where you're not preaching a sermon like maybe they want you to or somebody don't like you and next thing you know, they've got the whole church against you. When if we're good Christians like we're supposed to, when somebody starts that mess, you're supposed to fix it. Don't go to the pastor to fix it. Now I'm saying if, the, if Ken gets up here or if I get up here and I'm not preaching the gospel, I don't need to be here. But you don't do it because everybody gets against me and attacks me. There should be a leader in the church should come up to me and say, hey, we need to sit down and talk about what you're preaching. And if you're not going to change it, we're going to have to get somebody else. But don't go out and get the whole church against him so you can vote him out. It shouldn't be a vote process. I never have been a big fan of the vote process. Because all you got to do is get enough people that hate him just as bad as you do, and you can have something done. But if you really want to do it the way God says to do it, is we're supposed to get on our knees, and God's supposed to be the one that guides us and directs us. And if the pastor's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, the men of the church ought to be man enough and Christian enough to say something to him and not make a big spectacle of it. So don't stoop as low as the next man. And this is the last one. And this goes a little bit along with what I first talked about. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, it says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endure to the end shall be saved. This, this little one little scripture, if we want to take any other scripture, kind of nips the one time thing in the bud. Meaning that you just had one prayer that you said, hey, I asked Christ and I believe in him and I'm good to go and I can go out and I can live like the world and I'm still getting in the door. See, we'd have to admit this one. Because it says, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. You're not going to be hated by men if you come in and you accept Christ. Go out and live in the world like everybody else. You're not going to be hated. Because then it says, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Who's going to get it? It's going to be who endures. Now, I'm not saying we don't have assurance of salvation. But a one-time prayer don't get you in the door. There has to be a commitment from you and that you're not going to stop because of what circumstances you've been dealt. See, it's easy for us to say, you know what? I'll serve Christ as long as everybody at that church is nice to me. 
I'll serve Christ as long as, you know what, as I leave, at least five people shake my hand before I leave. I've had people say, you know what, he didn't speak to me today. He must be mad at me. Well, why didn't you go up and speak to him? Are you mad at him? It goes both ways. See, we get to a point where we want to always put it off on somebody else. He didn't speak to me today, and I don't know why, and I ain't going back out there. Well, what if he thought the same thing? We'd have two people gone because you didn't speak to him either. Some have made a good start, but have come to a bad stop in their Christian life. Because why? Satan attracts, distracts, and attacks them. I've often said, I don't have to do anything bad for Satan to win. I have salvation, and he can't take that away from me. The Bible says he can't take it away from me. But all he's got to do is put other things in my life or allow, let me say this, he don't even have to put them. We can do it fleshly. Sometimes we do it with God's blessings. God blesses us with too much sometimes. And I'm afraid in America we've been blessed with so much that those things have become distractions to where we can't serve Christ. See, all Satan needs to do is put something else in, it doesn't even have to be bad. It could just be might even be a family member. And they're not bad family members. But I can't go to church because this family member, the only time they want to come over is at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Well, have you ever had a conversation with them and tell them you have an obligation at 11 o'clock? If they would get there at 1230, you'd be more than glad to have dinner with them or whatever. But see, sometimes things just happen because we don't have conversations to fix it. We just let it go on, whatever it is. Sometimes we have to make stands that's not pretty. We have to make stands that hurts people's feelings. But you know what? Do you not think when we stand before the judgment that all those things are going to come up? I think they are. Again, you may not believe that, and maybe they won't. You could think that if you stick your finger in this outlet over here, it ain't going to shock you either, but it doesn't make no difference. I assure you, whatever you think makes no difference. If there's power on that outlet and you stick your finger in it, it's going to bite you. And you will not like it. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. Because you know what? I've had that happen to me before. And did you know I've even had people tell me that it won't do that? You say, well, how in the world will somebody do that? They say, well, I've cut the power off to that. Don't worry about it. It won't shock you. And you stick your hand in there as if it don't have no power. And yes, somebody lied. Because it got me. So see, I know as my own self, before I stick my finger in there, if I didn't turn it off, I'm going to check and make sure it's turned off. Because I don't like it. I do not like that. But see, that's what happens to people in church. You just go off what somebody else says. You know what? We've been preached to for so long, and I'm not talking about here at this church. And it drives me crazy, and this may be the best thing that y'all like forever. But I go to these meetings, and they say, all you got to do is raise your hand and pray a prayer, and then nobody ever follows up. Nobody ever knows whether who said it or didn't, but they say we had 300 get saved. How do you know that? Because if, if getting saved is not a one-time prayer of belief, you don't know if they got saved or not. The only way you have evidence of a getting saved is how they live their life afterwards. And as much as I like a lot of y'all, and well, I guess all of you, but I would not trade my salvation for y'all's no matter how many times you say you've got it. Because there's only one person in this room that I know is going to go to heaven. That's me. Now there's some in here that I think's going and the percentage is a lot higher than some others. But even the ones, I'll use Ken for an example. 
Because I think everybody would be like, if anybody's going to make it, Ken's going to make it. I mean, you know, we're going to say that. But I wouldn't trade mine for his. Because what if there's a point one percent that Ken didn't get it? You willing to risk yours? Your hundred percent that you know you got it? No. See, we listen to other people so many times that everything's just okay. Pray a prayer. And you say, well, that's really, there's not evidence of that. Well, there is, because there's a young man that, and I'll just use this church for an example. He went to this church whenever he was a young boy. He's probably about 40 today. He's roughly about 40 years old today. And I sat in his living room, and I had a conversation with him, and I said, you know, based on the evidence of his life, he's not a Christian. I'm pretty sure that anybody that would look at his life and if he was honest with himself would look and say he's not because he's never really acted like a Christian ever. Except whenever he was in vacation Bible school when he was about eight or nine years old and he said that he accepted Christ. And he made the comment to me, he said, I got saved when I was eight or nine years old and he said, I can live like the devil while I'm here on earth but I'm still going to go to heaven. We may not say it out of our mouths, but our actions preach that message. But all we have to do is say a prayer, and all we have to do is just believe for an instant, and we're good to go. Don't believe the lies of Satan, other believers, if that's not what this book says, it's not the truth. This is the final word. I, Ken is not the final word. I love Ken to death, and there's probably not a man in here that I respect more spiritually and even in a physical form than Ken Perdue. But he is not an authority over this. If what he says contradicts this, then me and him need to have a conversation. Not me and Tim have a conversation about Ken's contradiction because that don't fix nothing. But also, no problem is too difficult, no trial is too severe, no burden is too heavy for a Christian because why? God's help and grace is sufficient. There's nothing that will happen in your life. I can assure you this, that God's grace is not sufficient. Now you might think he stretched it all the way to the end and the ropes, the rubber band is getting ready to break. But his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. Because why? Romans chapter 8, verse 37 and 39, it says, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Talking about Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we believe the book and we read these scriptures, then why do we not live it? And I'm not trying to toot my own horn this morning because there's no reason that I should be here other than that Christ allowed me to be here this morning. Because all physical aspects, I wouldn't want it to be here. I shouldn't be here. but Christ allowed me to be here with these circumstances for a reason. And it may be because there's somebody here today that's battling something similar. And you're at a crossroads and don't know how to do it. So when we think about the snares that Satan's given us or that he has for us, they're going to be rabbit gums all along your life's way. And I assure you, everything in the rabbit gum you're going to like. 
See, the rabbit gums on my life don't have drugs and alcohol because I've never, that's not a, I wouldn't even, look, I wouldn't even peep in the rabbit gum for drugs or alcohol. But there's so many other things that I would peep in that rabbit gum and be so tempted to go in the rabbit gum and not even think about the consequences because why? They're so appealing to me. They're desires that I have in my life. So don't allow Satan. He's going to put the snares there. You can't keep them away. But it's what you do with them. And if you're here this morning and there's a snare in your life that you know that's coming about or maybe one you failed to, maybe you need to come and get things right with Christ. Because all that we've talked about this morning, really, if you think about it, means nothing to somebody that's lost until you become saved. You can't say just trust in Him when you don't even know who Him is. But see, once you understand who He is and you have a relationship with Him, then you know, yeah, I can trust Him. But there may be people here this morning that's Christians that says, you know what? You just don't know the mess that I'm living with. You don't know the husband that I have to live with every day. You don't know the kids that I have to deal with. You don't know the wife that I have to live with. You don't know who I'm dealing with at work. If you had to deal with those kind of things, you would act worse than I do. And you might be right. But you don't need to dictate what you do based on all Alvin, how Alvin would react. It's how Christ would react. What would Christ do? So this morning as Jackie comes, she's going to play a song.